<sighs> oh, hey. Hey, guys. Listen. Do me a favor. You people have been with me for a while. Do not let me appear on an episode looking like spilt. Anyway, let's start over. What are we doing? Well, this is the closing episode for the Bonneville Junk Pile. Now, there's a couple playlists going on. They'll be scattered about. The first one is called, imagine that, the Bonneville Junk Pile. There's a link right up there right about now. And... Whoa. Ugh. Tore up from the floor up. Anyway, that just gave me a little gap there so I can give you the second um, playlist that you're going to want to see that this guitar was the subject of up there called um, Resetting the Neck on a Junk Arch Top. So, um, what we're going to do here is I'm going to go through this guitar. I'm going to tell you the story behind it. As soon as that kid with no muffler and an $850 pickup truck with $4,000 worth of tires goes by. Thanks, Padna. Anyway, this guitar is a The Prep. It says The Prep. It was made uh, under the Silver Tone label for Harmony in the 1930s and early 1940s. This model is a 1940 model. If you look inside, you're going to see a bunch of surgery scars. And uh, But the code in there says that this guitar was made in 1940. Now, what is this guitar worth? Well, it's 83 years old, number one. Um, and it's got uh, the V-shaped neck. That's using an indicator of one of these uh, eras, period correct guitars, and you start getting in the 30s and 40s, you see that, you see these narrow headstocks, you see Bakelite bridges. By the way, if you run across a Bakelite bridge, you want to make sure you scoop that up because there's people trying to sell them for $250, and if you've got one of these in original condition, it might have a Bakelite bridge on it. So, anyway... Um, if you find one of these on the market that's in fairly good shape, you're talking somewhere between four and six hundred and fifty dollars just stock. And I've given you enough playlists about buyer's guide to junk pile arch tops, what to be looking for when you get into something like this. I'll give you a link to that right up there, right about now. But anyway. My story with this guitar started off, you get those applications, um, that app, I guess that's what the young people call them. So it alerts you when something that you have uh, done a, a, a prearranged search for pops up. So um, I've got them on a few apps. Um, if you find out what they are, don't get on there because the guitars that are on there come to me first. I get first choice. That's the least you can do for me. Um, anyway, the bell goes off. It's a distinctive tone. Um, change the tone because here's what happens. If you don't change the tone and you're sitting in church and it happens too many times, they're like, he just abandoned Jesus to go buy another cheap arch top. So anyway, back to the story here. This arch top popped up, bang, um, and it said it was in Whittier, Whittier, California, cultural capital of the world. So I'm a good, even when traffic is good, hour from Whittier. Um, sometimes people that sell these apps, they don't get it. They got something you want and your life just ended till you get it. And you get all fixated and freaked out. And God forbid someone else would end up with your stuff. If one of the other four million people in the greater less Los Angeles metropolis were to get my guitar there is a huge problem i'm telling you son anyway so i meet in a place that's going to be safe by the parking lot between the whittier police department and the library 
So I get this thing. The action on it is no doubt this tall. And so I'm looking at this going, okay, um, let's just say I told you it was 83 years old. I didn't pay a dollar for every year the guitar was old. So that's where we started. Now, I knew that the neck was, uh, uh, the action was up there because of a couple of things. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a little structural lesson here today, and I've never talked about this. We've talked a lot about different things that go on with this guitar, but um, you know I'm an arborist. Um, you can read uh, trees uh, by the signs they're showing you. Um, there is a book called The Body Language of Trees by Klaus Matic. If you're in trees into trees, it, it's going to kind of blow your mind, but it's kind of like it, it tells you wood is like a teeter-totter. If it's leaning this way, this side is stretching, this side is compressing, a tension, compression, all those kinds of things. So um, we'll get into that part in a minute on this specific guitar. Again, refer to the playlist because I've talked a lot about this, this kind of stuff on this guitar, but when you have a waist here, that is not the ideal shape for an acoustic guitar so you get these dreadnoughts and jumbos and things that really don't have a pronounced one like this because when a guitar gets older and has a waist and things start to dry out and move around the waist starts shrinking and if the waist shrinks the only thing that can happen is if there's tension here and up on the headstock where the nut is the only thing that can happen is this part where they attach starts pitching in like this. This pitches in, the strings get taller, the neck moves this way, breaks loose here. Not only was the neck starting to break loose and everything was pitched in right here, but the whole back of it was off and loose right here, which means the head block, we'll call the block of wood that's in here, the head block and the, the block back here was the tail block. And so, I'm looking at this thing and there's cracks developing. Now, a crack running one way is okay. There was a, an episode I did about this one called Bandaging an Up an Old Arch Top. And everybody freaked out when I put um, these splints or covers or whatever you want to call them. But here's what happened. I knew from the way this was broken loose... And from the way the body was twisting, there was actually a piece of the body sticking out right here. And then almost diagonal to it was a piece of the body sticking out here. So I've told you again, wood is like a teeter-totter. If there's something here, there's something here. If you look at an indentation on one side of a tree on the trunk, and you go to the other side, and there's a rib sticking out that looks like this, you've got a frost crack inside the tree. Anyway, I should really do a video about structural dynamics of palm stems and wind, because I have written a paper about that. Anyway, moving right along. So I knew that when it come time to glue up this guitar and put the body back together, that the head block here had twisted. So not only was it broken away from the body, but it was twisted. And when that starts happening, you start gluing things back together. Wood doesn't just stretch after 83 years old. Grandpa's not that limber anymore. Anyway, so I knew when I glued the body back together to get rid of the bulge here and the bulge here, something had to give, and I knew that would be the body. There was a crack, a, a crack running here. No, guitar is crack, but when you see a crack running here and then a smaller crack running that far away from it, and they're both running at an angle, that's a torsional shear. That's twisting. So I glued up everything. I broke the body loose here and here and glued a cleat in up here at the top of this crack and one up here and glued up everything, got the hide glue going. As soon as I started cinching it up, what do you know? The body split wide open, boom, here and back here. And that was equidistant to the part of the bulge sticking out here and here. So, I did that video, let the guitar dry up, left it lay around for a while to adjust to itself. Then I started doing a series of episodes about how to... Re 
fret or, or, or reset the neck on a, an archtop guitar, and this was my guinea pig. Um, I talked about whether a guitar was worth doing a neck reset, um, the economics of all that, um, buying a guitar really cheap and then having it end up in this kind of condition and having all the purists freak out on you. Um, and then I showed you how to build a steamer and uh, a neck pulling jig. And again, those episodes are up there. Just hover your mouse up there. So pop the neck of it off and then started thinking about how do you get a neck that's so flat and the body's caved in. So I got the body fixed, but how do you get the neck to pitch back down like this? So that involved um, cutting some wood off here at the heel. Um, this was a what I call a student instrument, a very thin a one layer fretboard. So I um, did some work on there. You see that piece of chick flick teal wood. But anyway, I got the, the, the neck to bend back like this and got it to sit where it wasn't pitched this way or this way and this way. So there's a number of planes that you have to pay attention to because if you don't, the fretting uh, starts getting weird at the end. Then we refret the thing. We refretted everything because we had to take off the 15th fret to steam down into it. And the, the frets on this thing were flat. And again, this is an Econo instrument, even though they're worth, they say, somewhere between four and six hundred, six hundred fifty dollars $650. So, got it refretted. Um, the action on this thing, I can adjust it down to be right down to the board. I can, uh, to the fingerboard. Um, I can, you see there's a lot of gap right there. Can you see it? I can set that way down. I can get it up real high, dobro high, uh, whatever I want to do. So it worked out um, pretty well. So what did I do to this thing? Well, let's start at the back. And um, there's a lot of history in this. There's a lot of what you might want to call mojo on this. Now, um, you know that um, Tammy signs all my guitars before they go out. Um, if I've got a card left and you don't know who Tammy is, I'm going to give you a link to a little video that Margaret Garrett of Mr. Airplane Man did. I built her a guitar. I tracked her down, and she tells the story better than I can. But we took off the old, um, once Tammy signed the back, we took off the butter bean tuners that came with this. They were in pretty good shape, but this is going out on the road to get beat up and, and play gigs, and it has to be solid. So we put a set of... Um, Gibson Deluxe tuners on it. They kind of go with the theme, this old theme. Um, this is interesting right here. If you can see this, you see this triangle. Now, right above the triangle is a coin. And the way this works is the way this neck is. If you're somebody that does a lot of first and second fret work here like this, um, you're going to have your thumb right there where that coin is. And what this coin is, is it's actually a civil rights era coin off of, uh, that you would pay to get on a bus in Mississippi. So Jackson, Mississippi in the 60s, you would take this token and use it to get on the bus. Now, I think you all know what was going on then. And there were all kinds of seating arrangements. So I want you to think about that. Think about what that must have been like. Um, I'm glad we've come a long way since 1960. But um, carrying on with the blues theme here, um, you all know that um, I've built uh, guitars that were Sun House themed, Mississippi Fred McDowell themed, and that kind of stuff. And I am fortunate to know people all over uh, the place and I'll get a hold of them. They'll send me Mississippi River water, Mississippi clay dirt, stuff like that, and also collect things from uh, different places that are historically important to me or the blues and send me stuff. So you all know that I like to listen to Sun House music. Um, I've, I think I'm out of cards here, but search my channel for Sun House or Alan Wilson or Reuben Lacey. In fact, there's a, there's a, um, an episode coming out in a couple weeks about Reuben Lacey. I did one before, but here's the deal. Sunhouse was running around Mississippi 
and he had been uh, trying to make some money as a preacher. He had kind of a sordid uh, background going on about the time, so he decides he's going to be a preacher. So there's someone running around named Reuben Lacey. So like some preachers do, they'll pick out some person that's doing something and use them as a model of what not to do to their a blooming congregation that they're trying to build. Um, I think Son House said it all when he said, I'm going to be a Baptist preacher so that I don't have to work. Yeah. Anyway, Son House is cussing Reuben Lacey, saying, you know, that slide music that they're playing is the devil's music. And, um, well, it's never been proven that Reuben Lacey actually used a slide. Anyway, so Reuben Lacey goes off to another town. Next thing you know, Sun House is playing slide music and, and blues music. Um, and uh, he went on to have a recording career and hooked up with Charlie Patton at Lula, Mississippi and went up to Grafton, Wisconsin and la la la. So this piece of wood right here on the top of the triangle is actually from a tree on the grounds where the uh, Wisconsin Chair Company was in Grafton, Wisconsin. So, fast forward, uh, Sun House does a bunch of recording. Um, he's last recorded in Mississippi by Alan Lomax, 40, 40, 41, and then goes up to Rochester, New York, and is rediscovered there by some people, uh, including Dave Evans and John Fahey and uh, those people. So they bring him back out of retirement. By that point, he's hitting the sauce pretty much every day, and he doesn't know how to um, play his own music that well. It had been, you know, 30 years. So Alan Wilson, who ended up being a side guitar player for the, for the band called Canned Heat, um, through a band member... Uh, Bob Height, collect, he collected a bunch of 78 records. So Alan Wilson would li listen to his records and he would play side guitar and he knew how to play Sun House's music. So David Evans interviewed Sun House in 1964. Um, Alan Wilson participated in the interview. John Fahey was there. And um, they basically brought Alan Wilson in to help Sun House learn how to replay his own music. Um, during that interview, it was revealed that Sun House had been influenced by Reuben Lacey. So that team of people ended up trying to find Reuben Lacey, and they found him in a church in Ridgecrest, California, which is a couple hours away from L.A. I've actually been there again. If you look at my video episode list, you're going to see things about Reuben Lacey with an episode coming up soon. So anyway, what this triangle is, is again a piece of wood from the grounds where the Wisconsin Chair Company was in Grafton, Wisconsin. You have a piece of wood from Reuben Lacey behind his church. And you have a piece of wood from the Topanga Canyon, uh, California location that Alan Wilson died at. So that's what that triangle is. Um, moving down... Um, we bolted on the neck. We reset the neck. Everything worked out fine, but I went ahead and bolted the neck on. It's an Allen bolt, so you can take it on and off. Everything is hide glued in here, so you could steam it back off. Um, inside of this guitar, it looks like Frankenstein because there's splits. I filled the split with um, veneer wood glued together and then... Um, sanded all that down, got it smooth and stabilized it, and then put the patches on. So let's flip around the front here. Um, I covered up the pier thing and put a Marvel Mystery Oil can on here. And um, the strings, of course, the fifth string always has some uh, Eli Green hoodoo voodoo bead of some source or another. Um, Eli Green used to sing with Fred McDowell, and he did a song called Bulldog Blues. And if you get into Bob Log the Third and Do Rag, uh, the band he was in before that, he will tell you that hearing the Fred McDowell song Bulldog Blues with Eli Green singing in the background and Fred McDowell running up and down 
the fretboard with a slide making it sound like a horse running was very influential on him. I, I swear if you get the Do-Rag uh, album that has uh, John Henry on it, you'll you'll see Bob Log the Third can play old Mississippi blues, that's for sure. I know some Europe tour stories with R.L. Burnside and T Model Ford and stuff that Bob has told me I should sit him down the next time I see him and, and get him to tell you those stories. But anyway, so moving along, we put uh, all these matchbooks on here. Um, they're all Mississippi matchbooks. There's stuff on here from Holly Springs um, and, and different Magnolia stuff and, and whatever. But these are all Mississippi matchbooks. We refretted the neck again. We used Gibson Deluxe Tuners. I, I put um, Stumac frat wire on here, good frat wire. The frets are bigger. Um, we built up the, the uh, fingerboard with that brace piece under here. And then I put, this is a Gretsch pickup that mounts to the side of the fingerboard. It's narrower than some fingerboards, so you would basically have to cut out a part of the fingerboard right here and, and arrange the frets to accommodate that but I was able to use that piece of wood that we put underneath there to get the angle of the the neck right and mount it there it sounds good um, the, the, the bridge is pretty interesting here I took a piece of scrap wood um, from a Patron cigar box and then I put the part of the Marvel Mystery Oil can that says uh, Marvel on there. I have another little story for you. Charlie Patton, again, whose son House met at the Lula, Mississippi train station and ended up uh, being talked into going to Grafton, Wisconsin. Charlie Patton had done a number of recordings along the way, and what the people at the record company, Paramount Record, wanted was new talent to come in, new names. Sometimes you'll find that people were recording under different names. And whatever, but Charlie Patton took Sunhouse and Willie Brown up there with him for a recording session. Anyway, Charlie Patton recorded under a couple songs under the name The Masked Marvel, The Masked Marvel. And the game was that if you could guess the real name of the artist, The Masked Marvel, I think they would, in, uh, they used to have this thing called Say, self addressed stamped envelope. So you send the record company. Uh, your your guess uh, of who it was, and then they you put an envelope in there with your address and already a stamp on it. And if you guessed that the masked Marvel was uh, Charlie Patton, they would send you a coupon where if you bought three records, you get one free. So, <laughs> yeah, record executives were pretty smart back then. But anyway, when you see this Marvel, think of Charlie Patton, the masked Marvel. Um, the bridge on this thing is a floating bridge. It's adjustable with thumb screws. It's pretty high up there. But again, that gap, I can bring bring it down, get the action really close to the deck. Um, I replaced the nut on here. It's got a bone nut. Took, took everything off, filed it, um, and did what I needed to do. It's got the original tailpiece. Um, I put a strap button here, those, those old uh, tapered... Uh, strap buttons you can't trust those get rid of them um, I, I filled that up with good wood and then put a uh, modern strap button on there and then of course you know there's gonna be a couple things on my guitars and one of them is always a grease zerk so there's a grease zerk right there it's actually functional you could fill the guitar with grease I'm not sure Andy would like that that much but it does have the original tail piece on it it's wound up with 11s, and um, when I interviewed uh, the person that it's going to, Andy, I said, you know, do you like Mississippi? you like Mississippi-themed stuff? Um, and so we found this plate that um, when it come time uh, to put the input jack on it, I use pin end jacks. I always do whether there's going to be a strap button or there because they're tough, they're beefy. And then, of course, this license plate fragment has a year somebody was born on it. But it also solidifies what's going on around here because the sides of these guitars, the, the, the material that was used is pretty much paper thin. And I've noticed if you use 
a regular um, input jack, those thin, small ones that they tend to come unwound all the time and stuff, and I don't care for that much. It's got good potentiometers on it. It's got a volume and a tone and that Mississippi license plate. And um, that's pretty much it. Um, it does make noise. I don't play guitar well, but... <laughs> You know that you know that one you go from you just you just you're basically pulling up on the 12th fret bottom string high string I don't even know what strings are called but you're pulling up with your slide and then just slapping down like this so you're going 12 10 up to 3 like this what that is yeah that's Robert Johnson up jump the devil so I'm gonna put this in a box now I'm gonna ship it to Ireland and the one request I have uh, for you and the person that gets this guitar I want you to, to um, find the song by the Bonnevilles called hell h-e-l-l -L. I believe most of you know where that is right so um, but Andy, here's my request for this guitar. I want you to play Hell, your song Hell, the Bonneville song Hell on this guitar and tape it for us and I'll share that with everybody. So hey, guess what? Um, here's another one out the door. Um, I enjoy uh, doing this work. I like the part where the ideas start to come together and I like knowing that I saved something that was headed for the fire pit or the trash pile or whatever. So um, if you like this kind of stuff, you like the history, tell me what you want to see. If I can accommodate that, I will make a comment. Subscribe and give me a like if you can, and we will look to see what the Bonnevilles are going to do with this guitar.